Hey, welcome into Falcons Audible, presented by AT&T, along with DJ Shockley. I'm Dave Archer. We don't have Derek Rackley with us. Rack is with his family over the Christmas holidays. They're doing a little bit of traveling, so we'll get Rack back in the pocket here uh, next week. But for now, it's Shock and I, a couple of quarterbacks coming at you. Yeah, we're disc- we're going to discuss this Baltimore game and certainly how that went down in a frigid showdown in Baltimore. Uh, we'll look forward to the keys of the game and what the, what might happen with the Arizona Cardinals coming in, a banged-up Arizona Card- Cardinal team coming in here. And then we're out of the playoffs, so what are we doing? Why are you still playing? Do you just shut it down after week 15, week 14, don't even play the rest of the games? No. There's a reason why you continue to play. We're going to discuss that as well here on Falcons Audible, brought to you by AT&T. First of all, shock, Merry Christmas to you. Did it go well for the family? Yeah, man, same to you, man. all went well, uh, obviously – Falcons played on Christmas Eve, so, you know, uh, I think we all were working up until uh, Christmas and then uh, obviously had the day off, so all was good. Kids got uh, exactly what they wanted, and uh, which was good, man. How about you? Yeah, it was, a, it was a fun time to spend time with family. R- rare situation because in football, kind of holidays are optional no in doubt. football. I mean, football whether it's season, Thanksgiving, yeah. Christmas. Yeah. But this was kind of a cool moment for us as Falcons, and there were a, a number of other teams that played – on Saturday, you had the what? You had the eight, six teams that played on Sunday, right? And of course, uh, the the two teams that played on Monday night were were given Sunday as well. So a rare moment for you to to have that a uh, Sunday off that late in the season, and for it to be Christmas Day, pretty cool to spend yeah. time with the family. I had a chance to visit with Arthur Smith on his coach's show for radio uh, this week, and asked him about that, and he says, "Yeah, that was a, a very rare and and cool opportunity." He's got three young children, mm. so he had a chance to be. Uh, be home with his kids and stuff like that. So pretty cool opportunity for Arthur. You guys, you, you guys got home a good enough time, right? I mean, we did. We got yeah. back about nine o'clock on Christmas Eve, nine nice. nine nine thirty ish. Yeah. So Christmas Eve night, and then uh, of course uh, the next day was unabated. You had how, an opportunity how, to spend some time with your family. How did you survive out in Bmore? Where did you have enough layers on? I know it was kind of cold. Well, that's a good question. Coldest game in Baltimore Raven history. Now I know some of the purists out there are going to say, "Wait a minute." I saw some Baltimore games back in the day. They're in black and white, and people were freezing their rear ends off. Yeah, we're not talking about the Baltimore Colts. We're talking about the Baltimore Ravens, and so you can go back the length of time that they've been in existence. But this was their coldest coldest game on re- on record, I believe. At kickoff, the temperature was in the single digits, somewhere in that five range, I believe, somewhere in that neighborhood. The wind chill factor was below that of course but uh, it was chilly no yeah. question about it yeah. uh we we had the windows open on the on the broadcast booth the Baltimore Raven broadcast did not which included Hall of Famer Rod Woodson the windows were down we over way there way tougher than them we won come that. on give me some arch we won that yeah yeah, yeah. way tougher than our Baltimore radio Raven team Raven. kicked their radio team's ass <laughs> that's a dub that's what I want to let baby. you know uh, unfortunately, we we didn't score any points much like the Falcons did when they got in the red zone when it came to touchdowns but when we look back on this game, cold football game, how much did you feel you feel like that that played in shock, the cold weather and all that kind of stuff? You know what? I I think it absolutely was a factor. You look at some of the, the plays in the game where there's wind and maybe the ball was knocked down a couple of times. But at the end of the day, they had to play in it as well. Mm-hmm. So I, I think regardless of if it was too cold, if it was windy, both teams had to play in the same kind of environment, had to play in the same kind of game. So – uh, I don't put a lot of stock into the weather being a huge factor. And you think at some of the things that happened in the game, the weather really had nothing to do with it. Um, and obviously, you know, this was a big question that, uh, you know, a lot of people asked Arthur Smith after the game. And, you know, I thought he answered it really well. Uh, but obviously there were three or four calls in the game mm. that absolutely changed the landscape of how that game could have been. You're talking about being on the one-yard line and you get the uh, the phantom, phantom <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, grounding call. grounding yeah. call where the guy absolutely hits Ritter's arm uh, was unbelievable. The you know Michael Pruitt was an absolute catch. You can see it on TV. I don't know how they overturned it. I still don't get that one. And then obviously you're watching OZ and the holding call going into the end zone where uh, you, you you know CP goes in and scores. So uh, absolutely there were some plays and we could talk about it because we won't get fined, so it's all right. Uh, <laughs> and right. I'm watching the game and I'm you know yelling at the TV. Uh, because they're taking stuff away from us, but uh, those are you know those are moments in the game that you look back on. But there's also other things in the game where you say, all right, Falcons didn't do well in this particular situation. And you know I, I heard you talk to a lot of the guys after the game, and that was one of the things they talked about was the situations of the game that hurt you. Uh, but I, I think defensively, you gave up too many big long runs 
They had a lot of what we call chunk yardage runs. I think they had four or five in the first half of 10, 15-plus yard runs in the game, and that really hurt you, uh, especially in the game. And obviously uh, the red zone was a big part of it, but I thought you did well defensively in the red zone. They had four trips in the red zone. They only kicked three field goals. So the defense did enough to keep you in the ball game. and we got to be honest, they scored 17 points, you know, you still should be in this ball game. You mentioned it coming on. We just didn't score enough points in this game uh, to make it one of those type of games where you say, all right, we got a chance. Yeah, I th- certainly think there's a number of things to be excited about or enthused about or encouraged about. If you just want to go to that level, you mentioned some of the stuff. Your red zone defense has been really good really the whole second half of the season. You've been really good about keeping teams out of the end zone, keeping yourself in the game. Now, with that goes along the fact of your inability to run, stop the run game, their yeah. ability to run it. You mentioned a couple of chunk runs that they were able to get, but just their ability to run the football and keep it in manageable third down situations, it allowed the quarterback, who's not a dynamic player like Lamar Jackson, yeah. Huntley was able to run for some first downs. Certainly that one touchdown drive that they got and they moved, pushed it down the field there right at the end of the first half, his run game on third down, they were one for five to start the game mm-hmm. on third down. They went three for three in that drive Mm -hmm. and punched it in to get themselves back to even par or 50% in third down. So I think there's some some things to be encouraged about. Where did you feel like the biggest struggles were? You talked about some of the stuff. And the referee calls notwithstanding, and there were some – you can imagine what I was doing on the radio. There was some (laughs) glaring screw-ups in that area. But – where do you think that if you're going to win this game this next week, and let's try to apply what happened in this one to maybe apply it to next week's game, what has to happen? What have you fix? You know, I think one thing that comes to mind is like some short yardage situations in the ball game on both sides of the ball where you have to be a little bit more stout. I just I go back to the first drive of the game. You get a great play on first down where you get eight nine yards on first down. A little you know a little pop pass to to Oz. You pick up eight yards. Second play, you get no gain. Third play, you have a fumbled snap, and now you punt the football, and it's you know three and out, and you you had a chance to go and get a first down and start the ball game, get your game, get the game rolling, and situationally in that ball in that part of the game, you have to be a little bit better in the short yardage part of the game because you got to be honest, haven't had a lot of explosive plays down the field, so it's going to come down to third and five or less sometimes in a ball game the way you run the football, and I think you have to be physical enough to be able to get those. Uh, throughout, you know, these next two ball games, and you've done that over over the span of the season. I mean, Tyler Algier has been awesome this year. I mean, his physicality and his runs have been really big at times. So you you want to lean on that for sure. Uh, I thought we took a step forward in the passing game at least. It was a little bit more efficient than you were in the first game. Um, obviously, there are throws that you want, there are plays that you want to have back. But I thought they were a little bit more efficient in the pass game, which we talked about last week, uh, which was a good deal. But defensively, you can't have the chunk plays. And, and I go back to it because in the previous game, it was chunk plays in the pass game. And those are just as demoralizing. But when they run it down your throat and you're picking up 11, 12, 13-yard gains and they never get to third down, that's the big part of uh, of this ball game. I thought you did a, a a pretty decent job in the second half, only giving up, what, three points, I think it was, in the second half. Um, so this is a, a game coming up against Arizona where it's going to be a physical nature game as well. Um, obviously, you don't have their quarterback in there in Kyler Murray. Um, I think Colt McCoy may be still be out. Trace McSorley we saw last week was a big part of uh, that ball game getting, getting the start. But – I think the the situations and the short yardage plays in the ball game are critical to the success of your having. But uh, to be honest, uh, I thought I thought number four uh, played a lot better from the quarterback spot. Yeah, no question about it. And I want to dive into that too. By the way, there's no truth to the rumor that Neil Lomax or Jim Hart will start at quarterback this weekend for the Cardinals. So we won't worry. We won't. We won't worry about that. Uh, and for you, if you don't know who that is, go look it up. Okay, there you go. Uh, Desmond Ritter. Uh, he's going to be the focal point. He has been for the last two weeks. He will be for the next two weeks. As the fans kind of try to digest, is this your guy? Moving forward, I'm not sure. We certainly can't answer that to through two games. Right. I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer that through four games. But you're getting a pretty good idea of of the improvement this guy is making through the first two games. We saw in in game one, and I'm saying game one is the New Orleans game. 
a little jittery to start off with, Shock. I thought that his pro- pocket awareness was not there. He wanted to get out too quickly. And then he, as he settled into the game, you kind of started to see his his ability for let his ability take effect as opposed to thinking too much. Now he's still thinking quite a bit because he hasn't played very much. But you saw that gradually progress to where he makes the play on fourth down to Drake. Now it didn't mm-hmm. turn out our way. And right. we'll talk a little bit about Drake laying the ball on the ground in back to back weeks. But he makes the play there at the end to give you a chance. The key to the for me, the key for Ritter was to start this game where he finished the last game. Mm-hmm. I thought he did that. He started off. You mentioned the OZ throw. You, he got started. I thought there was a couple things in the game that stuck out for me. Ball coming out on time. We yeah. saw a couple of games against New Orleans where the ball was late, right? No doubt. And some of that is not because he just doesn't know to trust the guys yet to turn it loose on mm-hmm. time. His bench route or sideline route to Demir Bird is a big-time throw. Uh, in between the corner with a safety coming over the top, he shoots that ball in. Beard makes, Bird makes a nice catch on the sideline. And then the pocket awareness, mm-hmm. sliding in the pocket and kind of that short start sidearm, just a gas shot, blasts it right over the middle, fastball to Drake London mm-hmm. against the zone over the middle. Those are th- You talk about encouraging now. Those are cool moments. Yeah. And then, obviously, his hookups with Drake is coming. Drake's caught 14 passes in the last three games. Just your thoughts on the progress that Ritter's made, and and you hope he takes it from here now in the Cardinal game and takes it further on. But tell me about where you think he is. I think you brought up some great points and some things that he's done really well inside the pocket that gives you – a lot of encouragement. And you talk about poise at the line of scrimmage. I saw way more command at the line of scrimmage. I saw a lot of a lot more talking to his offensive line, changing plays, can, you know, uh, you know, have an opportunity to do so. I thought coming out of the third quarter where they changed the tempo and they went a little bit tempo on him and you could see him running the show. That was big in the ball game to see him able to do that on the road with conditions um, against a, a, a pretty good defense. I mean, you got to give – they got two linebackers who uh, are still running right now. I mean, they, they stay running. But it, it's fun to watch the things that he's done. And you talk about that that one throw to Drake. He climbs up in the pocket a little bit and then give Drake a lot of credit too. They're playing like some kind of zone on the backside. And if if Drake continues on his dig route, he continues, he's going to run into the backside linebacker. He just settles in the zone right there, gives him his numbers, and, you know, and then Ritter puts it on him. Those are the type of things that you want to see in game. You can see it all day in practice, but when the live bullets are flying around you and you're able to make those kind of throws, it shows you what he's about. And then you think about the last two weeks of, you know, kind of what he's had to overcome, the defenses that he's played. And I don't think people realize, you know, the 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 fronts that he's played against the last two weeks and the things that, you know, these defenses give you in a game and he's been able to decipher them and then be able to move this team down the field and make some plays. And he's only going to get better. 22 or 33 for 218 yards is, you know, you see the progression starting to get there. I think he had nine different pass catchers in his ball game. Uh, Drake had nine targets. You talk about their their connection. There was another play I want to talk about on that on the it's on the left side. And it's a timing throw as well. And it looks like Drake maybe has a, a fade stop, and he can't get on top of him, and he stops. It's the play where he, you know, gets the foot down and gets the elbow down. They had to review it. That's the timing. Yeah. And he had to review it. And the timing of that play was pretty unbelievable because he lets the ball go, and I'm watching it, and I, I went back and looked at the film. Ritter lets the ball go. It's halfway there, and the guy still has a arm or hand on Drake, and he's battling at the top of his route. But the most important thing that happened in that route is, even though he's running this outside release, fade kind of stop, he gives his quarterback five yards worth of room on the sideline, and that's exactly where Ritter puts that football high and away, and Drake comes down with it, and it's a, you know, ends up being, you know, a catch. Just an unbelievable timing from Ritter on that particular throw, because if he doesn't, guess what? It's probably a, 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 a pass breakup or it's not complete and you're not even worrying about the review. So those are some of the small nuances in the game that, you know, people never really realize. And there's probably even more that when they turn on the tape and they watch it and there's so many things probably in the run game that he's doing that we have no idea about. But he's putting them in, you know, into good situations. So I I think if you're a Falcons fan, you are very encouraged on what you've seen from week one to week two. From Desmond Ritter. Yeah, I hope you are. I hope your fans are paying attention because they are they are definitely uh, showing some signs 
of some really good play at that position. It seems to be getting better. You mentioned a couple of things that really jumped out at me. Jumping into the no huddle and or tempo in the middle of a game. It's one thing to do it in in two-minute offense or late in the football game. Mm. You go to a limited amount of plays. It's something you work on, and and you try to flood people throwing the ball. It's another thing to do it in-game. Shock will tell you that now all of a sudden the whole playbook's available because remember the coach is still in your ear to a certain time on the play clock. So now I'm coming up, dummy audibles, doing all sorts of stuff to try to maybe get a guy jump offside, get them to declare themselves, and then I'm going to step back and I listen to the coach, and now I'm going to change things. Yeah. He's got the whole playbook at his disposal with that personnel group in the fee- on the field. A lot of trust there from Arthur Smith. A lot of uh, maturity and poise for the young quarterback. Um, also trust in the fact 33 attempts, most we've had all year. 22 completions, most we've had all year. Oh, well, yeah, the, yeah. And, and that's just his second game on the field, him, him putting out those numbers. And, yes, those will get better. Yeah. They're going to get better as he gets more and more accustomed to being in the game and more and more accustomed to the field. Mentioned Drake London. He's got 14 receptions over the last uh, last two games. You career, talked to career catches in yards last two weeks, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so he's doing. And so he and Ritter certainly have. There's something going on there. There's some magic going on there, and I think that's only going to get better. Nothing told you more about that than that little red zone throw where he makes the little sail route and he Ooh, gears it down. Talk to me, give it to him. He elevates in it in front puts, of three dudes right put, there. Puts yeah. it on him and trusts in his his young receiver to go up and get the football. I think there's a real connection there between between those two. All right, let's talk about you know kind of the the elephant in the room, if you will. Drake's laid the ball on the ground the last two weeks. Yeah. Um, yeah. I talked to him uh, yesterday on the coach's show, uh, and he says, that's all on me. He says, I've got to understand. He says, I have a real good feel for situational awareness from zone coverage, where to sit it down. If no a guy's going to play me, man, the leverage and how I can get on top of the guy or create separation for my quarterback. I got all that. Yeah. And I'm still going to continue to work on that just because I got it. He says, my work has to be in situational awareness of protecting the football. Mm. He says, and you watch him. He tried to cover he up. He tried, yeah, he did. Give Humphrey credit. Humphrey comes in and pops it out of there. He immediately went to the sidelines, took, took his sleeves, sleeves off. off. Yeah. Um, so he says, that's something that I've got to continue to work on. He recognizes there's an issue there. Uh, he's got to take care of that. But I applaud, again, you start talking about maturity of these young players. Here's Drake London. Uh, here's a guy that understands, hey, I've, I've created some problems for my own team. Yeah. I've been a problem for us, and he, he understands it, and he's working on his game. Yeah, and, and what's interesting enough about that is we've seen, uh, you know, a guy around this league who didn't play well and didn't own up to it and how much flack he took for it. And for Drake to immediately come out and say, yeah, that's on me, that's an issue that I'm hurting my team with, is huge. It's big because he understands he's – one of the key catalysts, not only to his team, but his offense, and he's making plays doing it. And obviously that's going to happen. You're going to have time to time where, you know, things don't go your way. But I love the fact that, you know, he owned up to it for one. Like you mentioned, you you, you talk to him and say, hey, that's on me. That's something I got to clear up. But then he continued to play, and he continues to fight. And even in the fumble last week, as he's starting to run, in our running motion, you know, with one arm coming forward, one arm coming back, that's when the ball was hit coming out. I mean, those are just – some of those are freak things. And obviously, yeah, he got to make sure he takes care of the football. That's number one. But owning up to it, being mature enough in his rookie season where, you know, he's had some success and then he's had these instances where things have gone against him, he hasn't let him get him down. He's continued to play the style of football that everybody expected when he came in, and he's been a key part of what this offense is all about. So, you know, 14 catches, I mean, he's – you know, he's had – I mean, probably over 25 targets the last two weeks, and he continues to be a guy that can create separation for you, makes big plays in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the game for you. You talk about that throw and catch that he made on that sail route. It's unbelievable. You got OZ on the outside, clearing him out with a post, and they literally got a triangle around him because the, the, the linebackers dropped so deep. And to be honest, Ritter probably should have got off of it and checked it down. But you look at having trust in a receiver. And that speaks to Ritter, that speaks to to Drake, is Drake knew not to run so fast into it because you still got that cover three corner over there, and it's kind of tight going into that red zone. And he kind of throttles down a little bit in there, but then also the throw by Ritter. It was high, but it was a little bit behind him where he didn't lead him into that corner. (laughs) Those are like the small things that are just so cool to watch. 
and the trust they had between each other to be able to go up and get that football uh, it's fun. I wish we were on video right now, and we will be back for you video-wise. We're making some adjustments out here from a from a studio standpoint, so just sound today, but we're going to get back on video for you. If you could have shocked, saw Shock's <laughs> eyes right there, he was lighting it up. He was using his hands. I love it. He's exactly right. Think about those kind of moments, and, and he and I, Shock and I both played quarterback, those kind of moments for a guy to do that for you yeah. when you let it go, that plays huge dividends down the road, whether it's a red zone throw, a third down throw, whatever it might be. You're going to be willing to put your guy up to back because you know he's going to go get the football. Let's touch on one other young guy here. You mentioned a little bit about Algier. Mm. He's now over 800 yards rushing, eight, I think 817, somewhere in that neighborhood. 1,000 yards kind of in, Two games. in, Let's go in, get in, yeah. the, in the view right here. Who thought fifth-round draft pick out of BYU um, – is going to come in and be your feature back. I think anybody that watched him on tape probably said, yeah, I can see that. But they got him in the fifth round. So credit to Terry Fontenot and the coaching staff and the, and the, and the scouts to go and get this guy when they did. Um, but he's been outstanding, Shock. I mean, he runs with power. I had no idea he was as good a receiver out of the backfield as he How about the catches and then the little niftiness in the open field to sidestep a guy and go get a first down? Thank you. This is encouraging. You're talking about young quarterback, young receiver, young running back. Woo. How do you got to get excited about that? I mean, it's bright as these lights in here right now. I mean, come on, let's be real. I mean, it's it's going to be fun to maybe see these three grow over the next few years and become maybe, you know, uh, something that's one of the most exciting things to watch in the league. And I, like you mentioned, going in the fifth round, maybe you thought, okay, yeah, he'll get some playing time late in the season or he'll start to take over that role. I mean, you have to be honest, where would this offense be without Tyler Algier? I mean, obviously, CP was out for a little bit. Um, you, you got some, you know, guys that's trying to fill that spot. Obviously, you move Avery over. He's been a part of it. Uh, Huntley was, a, you know, obviously a big bruiser who was absolutely big for you throughout the season before you end up getting hurt um, last week. But I think the number one thing that comes to mind is, Arthur Smith said, when we watch this guy on film, the number one thing that stuck out for us, and you see it every single week, his ability to break tackles. And they said they saw that from game one when they turned on the tape, his physicality running through arm tackles, and you see it every single week when he has the football in his hands. And then you add that that extra uh, characteristic of being able to catch the football out the backfield. That means he can stay on the field for all three downs and be a critical piece to what you need. And you can use other guys like CP and other places that can help you. But I love the fact that when he comes in the ball game, there is a different – different demeanor about this offense and he's physical he's downhill um he wants to come back and he's going to continue to pound you the first guy will not make the tackle you see it may be a zero yard game it's going to be two three yards game because he's going to he's going to run through you and he's going to have a have a, a finishing factor about him but it's been great to see Algier turn into the guy that has become the feature back for this Falcon team and you know when you have a run game like a guy in Algier, it makes your offense so much better. It takes a lot off your quarterback. It takes a lot off Ritter uh, going into a, a ball game knowing you have a guy like that. So it's it's been fun to watch the progression of a lot of these rookies as the season progresses and, and not hit that rookie wall like a lot of guys do. seems like he's continued to get stronger. Yeah, he really has. Uh, I think absolutely good points on all that with Algier. All right, let's be real. 0 for 4 in the red zone, that's, that's losing football. Uh, 5 for 14 on third down one for four on fourth down that means you were six for 18 in conversion situations you can't win football games that way now there's a lot of reasons for why that's happening execution of the players you can't put your finger on one thing you can't say okay it's the quarterback okay it's the offensive line it's it's this guy dropped the ball there's a lot of reasons for that uh oh for four in the red zone let's face it and let's be real here the referees contributed to that. There were a couple of calls. The OZ oh, holding call is ridiculous. Um, <laughs> go back and look at the tape. He pushes the guy down. They throw a flag on him. He had There was no hold at all. OZ, he's not big enough to hold anybody, <laughs> but let alone he didn't hold anybody there. CP no scores. Doubt. The grounding call, you talked about it, Shock. He clearly gets hit. The rule is if he's if the arm is, is hampered in any way with the motion, it's not grounding. That was a blown call. You heard Arthur Smith, I'm sure, over the ref's mic, how he felt about that call. But then there's also you got to take some onus on yourselves as players and play call. Maybe we're not getting into the right stuff, and that'll be something that Arthur Smith will grind on to try to make sure that he fix whatever play calls are getting to 
on third down. So that that's just touching on some of the realness that's out there. Defensively, let's talk a couple of young guys real quickly before we move on to get, beating the Cardinals. Um, some guys that are sticking out for you on the defensive side of the football because there's some young players on that side that are coming too. Yeah, I mean, you obviously saw – D'Angelo Malone have some more time. You see AK have, you know, some 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 more uh pressures in this ball game. Obviously Troy Anderson uh getting a second start being, you know, flying all around the field. I mean, this is a, a defense that's was kinda put together kind of patchwork to be honest. I mean, we had a lot of guys here coming in on a on a one year deal or you had a lot of young rookies, you know, playing this season. Um but this has been a, a, a fun defense, I say, to watch because of how some games have started, but then how they've been able to adapt to it, how they've been able to change, how they've become um, a defense that understands, you know, okay, you can bend a little bit, but once you get in the red zone, you tight down. And we saw this in this ball game where you force three field goals, so you're keeping yourself in this ball game. That's happened, you know, the last two, three weeks. This is a a, a defense that these guys are continue to fight. These guys are continue to play at a at a high level for you, and, and you like some of the the young talent that you're seeing. Uh, Troy obviously moving into that linebacker spot playing um, next to a guy like Rashawn Evans mm-hmm. is huge. You know, that communication that you can have in game, that you can see on tape, you can come to the sideline and talk about it. Those are things that you can absolutely build on in these last two games and going into the next season that you got a veteran guy next to you and a rookie who is just as talented um, to be able to come in here and have and have the impact that he's having. So it's it's been good to see – like we said, the evolution of the guys on offense, but it's continuing to happen on the defense side of the ball as well. Yeah, and I, I thought that Drake had a, a, an important thing to say. I was asking him about the rookies. Obviously, the three that we've talked about on offense, you mentioned Troy Anderson, you mentioned uh, Malone, Ebba KT. He says, don't forget now, we're pretty young in some other spots too. Uh, AJ's not a very old player. Right, you know, He's right. played a lot of football, so there's a lot of young players on this team that are kind of – Both safety str- still young. Yeah, yeah and, they're, and they're struggling <laughs> to get over the hump. You keep hearing about them. They need to win. And, and he said, hey, maybe we need to go through some of these hard times and kind of kind of harden us a little bit that mm. we don't want this feeling to be able to get over the hump and win some of these games. Now, there are things to fix on the defensive side as well. Uh, this is a defensive team that has not been very good against the run. Now, they've gotten better as you got down deeper in territory, got down deeper in the red zone but not very good against the run. They haven't put a consistent enough pressure on the passer. Those are things they're going to have to try to improve, and that might be an off-season scenario when you start bringing in some players now that you get freed up from a money standpoint. And we gotta, maybe, maybe bring some more players And we've got to be honest, when you give up nearly six yards of carry in yeah, a ball can't game, do it. that's, that's going to be tough on, the, on any Well, defense. it makes third down easy, right? No All of a sudden, with a play caller, I'm third and three, not third and nine, yeah. right? Yeah, no doubt. And I mean, that's a big part of the game, obviously, as, as we talked about. Obviously, on our side, the ball is being able to run a football and it bodes well for you. Other teams are doing the exact same thing. I mean, they rushed for 184 yards, and it was like 5.9 a carry in the ball game. And we talked about the chunk yardage runs they had. And it puts your defense in a bind where, you know, you're kind of catching now because you're playing, you know, third and less or second and, you know, four or five, and the offense is wide open for that team. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on The Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, Find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. All right. Well, I'm sure there's fans out there that are discouraged and upset, and we're just trying to give you a couple of things maybe to focus on as you watch this, these last two games play out. Some of the young players that are going to be the bulk part of this football team and the playmakers on this football team that are going to be a part of you moving forward, just something maybe to focus on. Oh, let's take a look at the Arizona Cardinals. They come in on Sunday. Kyler uh, Murray tears his knee up two weekends ago. He's gone for the year. You mentioned Colt McCoy, their veteran. He's been banged up as well. They've gone to Trace McSorley, who played in the last game in maybe one of the more – I don't know if Monday Night Football has enjoyed this, but they've had some of the more unwatchable games <laughs> ever. But, uh, but that was a Sunday night game. That was not a Monday night game. That was a Sunday night game between Arizona and Tampa Bay. But Tampa found a way to win that game in overtime. So, Shock, when you look, when you think Arizona, what what immediately comes to mind, and what are some of the things the Falcon fans should watch for, and what does this team need to overcome here in Atlanta? Yeah, I think obviously with the change at quarterback, you know, it's it's a 
not a sore subject, but it's something that you look at and say, okay, maybe that's not the, the position of uh, concern that you had coming into this ball game. Kyler Murray, we know what kind of player he is, and not having him on the team obviously uh, kind of bodes well for you. You feel better about that situation. But they got a, a, a back in James Conner who's tough, he's physical, he's kind of built in the mode of like Algier. Uh, he's a downhill guy, played a lot of football for you. He's averaged over four yards of carry this season, you know, just over 700 yards. And look on the outside, uh, you got, you know, arguably one of the top three receivers in the game in DeAndre Hopkins. And, you know, he's missed a bunch of games this season, but he still leads the team in targets. Got 64 catches on the team that leads the team. And then you got the speed of Hollywood Brown on the outside as well, who's right behind him with 60 catches and, you know, over 90-some targets as well. So you have – those kind of veteran guys on the outside. You have a run game that's going to come in here and, and try to control uh, the atmosphere inside Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Take a little bit off your quarterback. Now, Chase, Trace last week threw it for – he threw it 45 times. Only had one interception in the game, 217 yards versus that Bucks defense who we know had some pretty good players on it. Um, you think he would only build off that. He comes in with a little moxie, though. You know, he's one of those guys who, mm -hmm. you know, can run around, can make some plays, but it's – Ultra confident. Watched him remember him playing at Penn State. Was a similar style player. Uh, and, you know, everything you hear from the Arizona side of it is this guy is just as confident as anybody else uh, coming in. On the defensive side, they got some really good players on that side. Buda Baker, Zayvon Collins, who he drafted a few years ago. Uh, big time, you know, uh, rusher off the edge. Isaiah Simmons is a guy who's kind of the, the hybrid guy that everybody looks like Play everywhere. Now. Play <laughs> yeah. everywhere. And then, obviously, the the freakish one year that's still doing it on the outside and J.J. Watt, who, you know, leads their team with nine and a half sacks. So, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, players who have, you know, done some good things in this league that you look for uh, ex ex exactly when you're watching this ball game. Uh, but you, you think about the last three ball games, this Arizona team has scored 13, 15, and 16 points on offense. Who's that sound like? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It's one of those, uh, you know, line up. Schlabernacher hit you in the face kind of ball games because sometimes there's not a lot of points scored and every possession coming in will probably matter. Yeah, and I think when you start looking at what what can Atlanta do against this uh, Arizona defense, they're going to run the football, obviously, and I think you can pound them with the run game. I think it is a team you can move the ball against. You mentioned uh, some of their really good players, and they've got some good ones. One of the best safeties in the game in Buda Baker. He had nine tackles last weekend mm. uh, or just this Sunday night against uh, a Tampa Bay in a, in a loss for them. Um, but they've got guys at all three levels that you like. Yeah. Uh, they have some issues as well. This is an opportunity to go win in your building uh, and start to build for the off season, and that's where I want to kind of go. That's kind of give, it gives you an idea of what Arizona is. Mm -hmm. I think we all know where Atlanta can kind of go. They're going to run the football. We'll see the expansion now. Desmond Ritter for the first time will play at home. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that's encouraging for the fans to come out and watch your young quarterback uh, play in this building. Uh, he's been on the road in two adverse situations: inside in New Orleans, tough place to play, and then outside in the frigid weather mm -hmm. uh, in Baltimore has afforded himself pretty well okay. against two pretty good defenses. Now you get one that you might be able to make some plays against, yeah. and, and you're going to be able to play inside with your with your people in the building. So let's take a look at it. one of the things that I think the fans get caught up in is, oh, let's just lose the last two games, we'll get a better draft pick. Okay, and yeah, that that probably would be the case if you lost the last two. Maybe your draft pick would improve. But why give an an idea of the mindset of the player shock if you can as to how you close this season out and why you close it out the way you do. You have two games left to play. And obviously the the frustration of the season has built up as a player. And all that matters, and you should feel a certain way. You work so hard in the offseason. You work so hard during the season. You work so hard week to week to win ball games. And I heard Grady talk about it after the game. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. I'm frustrated. I'm, you know, sad and mad that all this continues to happen week in and week out. But he said, I'm going to come in, and I'm going to continue to work these last two weeks. And I shouldn't have to tell another professional to come in and have that same attitude because it should mean something to you. And as a player, anytime you get a chance to put something on tape, you want it to be good. And here's the thing. Let's be let's be perfectly honest here. There are going to be changes in this building, in this team next year. Do you want to be a part of the change? Do you want to be a guy who is a part of this team or you want to be a guy that's on the outs because 
you're not playing for anything right now. And I think the biggest thing is when you go into the offseason, you want to go in on a high note. You got two games at home. You're playing for an organization. Do you want to be a part of this organization? You have to put good things on tape for the next team or whatever it may be or this team. You got to show this coaching staff, regardless of situation, regardless of how the season's going, I'm going to continue to fight for my brothers. I'm going to continue to fight for these guys that I work hard with, that I sweat with every single day. And I want to give everything I have for this team. I don't care what the situation is on the outside. I get a chance to play in the National Football League. You cannot take that for granted regardless of the situation because there are guys who are sitting out right now who would give their left toe, they give their left foot to freaking be in the uh, on a on a on a team for the last two ball games. So do not take it for granted. I think a lot of these guys they understand that they know it and they know that these next two games are tied to their career. We mentioned there are a lot of guys on one year deal. There are a lot of guys who are hanging on by you know a, a thread to their NFL career. And what you do in these last two ball games in practice, how you go out about your business, and then what you put on tape for other teams to see, for this Falcons organization to see, matters. So winning ball games does a lot for a lot of players. It does a lot for this organization. And you want to give everything you have because this is your job. This is what you're paid to do. And if you love it like you say you do, and if you love it to be in the National Football League, you should have enough wherewithal to go out and give everything you got. Yeah, so well said, Shock. So well said. You, you put your signature on every play, folks, yeah. because it's on tape. Yeah. Your peers are watching you play. There's other coaches. You may not be here in Atlanta, and we hope you are We as a player. And, and Shock just talked about, are you playing for your opportunity to be here in Atlanta? Yes. Yeah. But if you're not – and they see you're not playing late in the season, are you going to be someplace else? Probably not. As a teammate, I want to be able to trust G.J. Shockley. He wants to be able to trust Dave Archer that he's going to go out there and play as hard as he can possibly play because I've got the, I, I'm representing Atlanta. I'm representing the bird. There's no caveat you built in, oh, well, the season was over, so they weren't really playing. Right, that. right. You can't put the that, asterisk that, that doesn't it, yeah. That doesn't happen. <laughs> All you do is see the tape, and you see you either winning or you see your ass getting kicked. Yeah. So which do you want to be? Yeah. And that means you go out and lay it on the line. I owe it to my teammate to go play on the line, and that's why that. you will never see – or never hear of a mindset where players or a team or a coach is going to lay down at the end of the season and do the whole, I guess, NBA word, tank or whatever. That doesn't mm-hmm. exist in the National Football League. You owe it to your teammates and all that kind of stuff. We're not talking about April and what's going to happen in April. We're talking about what's happening right now. And you talked about momentum. I want some momentum going into the offseason. I want to feel good about us, ourselves going into the offseason. Let's make the other teams feel bad about themselves going into the offseason. No doubt. And I, I think one point you bring up is April, and I heard uh, Arthur Smith talk about it yesterday. There was a question posed to him about how do you finish these last two ball games, and you're, you're looking for, you know, the right draft pick. And he says, I understand your question, but let's be honest. You never know how – that top draft pick is going to pan out. Sometimes they pan out, sometimes they don't. So if you go into offseason putting all your eggs in the basket of, okay, well, we got a top five pick or we got a top six pick and it don't pan out, then what? So it's all about the here and now, and I love the fact that Arthur Smith had a resounding no. There's no way in the world anybody in this building is going to quote-unquote tank or not play their best to win these last two games. He's DJ Shockley. I'm Dave Archer. This is Falcons uh, This is Falcons Audible, presented by AT&T. Derek Rackley will join us again next week, and we'll be back on video for you really soon. I know you guys would prefer it that way. Like, subscribe, and review at Spotify, iTunes, AtlantaFalcons.com, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. We appreciate you being with us. We try to keep it real. Hit us back. Let us know what you think of what's going on. Throw us some throw us some comments our way. Some of the things you'd like us to talk about, we'll jop it up for you right here on Falcons Audible on by presented by AT&T.